You know that one song you can't get enough of? Chances are it was made with a sample from Splice. Explore top packs made by your favorite producers, sketch out song ideas in seconds with Create Mode, and dive into a sample catalog that's so deep, it's dangerous. Find out why Splice is the industry's not-so-secret secret. Visit splice.com and try for free today. Welcome to The Fader Interview. I'm Alex Robert Ross, Editorial Director of The Fader. In the two years since Faye Webster released her breakthrough third album, Atlanta Millionaires Club, on Secretly Canadian, the Atlanta musician, photographer and yo-yo enthusiast fell in love, wrote a new album, and, with her chic witty combinations of Americana, pop and 70s R&B, became emblematic of a new kind of Gen Z hybrid music. This month, she releases I Know I'm Funny Ha Ha, a wittily titled record that trades its predecessor's tales of loneliness and heartbreak for songs about the trials and tribulations of long-term domesticity. Earlier this month, the faders Shad D'Souza called Webster to talk about finding inspiration and happiness, releasing a record on her birthday, and her favorite games. Hi, Faye Webster. Welcome to the Fader Podcast. Um, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Good, thanks. You're in Atlanta right now? Yeah, I'm at, I'm at home in Atlanta. Rainy day, classic. Ah, rainy day in Melbourne as well. So before we get into your new album, I Know I'm Funny, Ha Ha, I want to just talk a bit about kind of your upbringing and your beginnings in music. Like, so you grew up in kind of a lineage of, of country and bluegrass players, if that's right. Like, can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, I kind of just like grew up always hearing like my brother playing guitar just like through the walls of our house. And like every time I'd visit my family, my family's always playing guitar or like mandolin like classic like bluegrass type instruments so yeah I kind of just was interested growing up seeing this and I was just like I want to do that have you ever felt like what you're doing is kind of in service of some larger family tradition or something or like do your parents or family kind of see it that way I don't know I feel like I definitely am a part of a creative family like my brother's in a band and my other brother does like design stuff I don't know. My parents have always been really supportive. So I don't I don't know if they just look at us and they're like, oh, our kids are doing the creative family thing. I think it's just like, oh, our kids are doing their thing. Have you ever collaborated with your, your brothers on any music? Yeah, I have. I've, I've sang on his band's songs a couple times. And like sometimes I'll take him on tour and he'll play bass. So yeah, we, we always find something to do together at some point. What was your kind of upbringing like? Like, so obviously you grew up in Atlanta. Like, was it kind of exclusively, I guess, like country and bluegrass that you were around? Or like, what kind of music were you exposed to early on? Yeah, I mean, definitely starting off just because like, I was just listening to whatever my parents were playing, like in the car or at home. Um, and it was mostly country, Western music. But yeah, I don't, I don't really think it was until I was like old enough to like start choosing like when you get to the age where it's like oh there's other other music exists I feel like that's especially when I started playing guitar I think that's when I explored a little more and just like was was listening to to other things and yeah and just being like influenced by so many different things and just being inspired I feel like I kind of just have like taken all these roots from from different inspirations and like I don't know made my music I guess <laughs> and personality whatever do you feel like that kind of early influence contributed to why you connect with like the the pedal steel so much? Yeah, for sure. For sure. I feel like I grew up listening to this instrument and it was just so mesmerizing, especially like seeing somebody play it. It's insane. And yeah, when I when I first started playing songs and it's like I'm just writing songs. I don't have recordings. I don't know what it even sounds like other than me singing and playing guitar, but I just knew I was like I want pedal steel. Do you still get that same kind of excitement from the instrument? I do. I feel like we complement each other really well. But also there's sometimes we're like in the studio live tracking and we'll be like, dude, get out of here. <laughs> this song is not for you. <laughs> but it's a healthy balance. You said you can't change your haircut, but it looks good anyway. Like 
so obviously your first record, Run and Tell, was this like quite a traditional country record in in many senses. Do you still connect with kind of that record and and that kind of songwriting? Oh, definitely not. <laughs> I just feel like at this point it's kind of just like a souvenir piece, you know, almost like I don't know, like a bad tattoo where it's just like. It, it represented you at one point, but like, I don't know anybody that's like, yeah, I love my 16 year old art <laughs> and my 16 year old self. But at the same time, it's like, that was me. Was that kind of early, I guess, like country influence why you were compelled to kind of move to Nashville? Yeah. Um, I was also just felt like I should have because just like senior year of high school when there's like all that like college pressure. I feel like that was kind of the first time where I really realized I was like, fuck, like, what am I about to do? Like, I don't, <laughs> I've never thought about this. And I've only done like music. Like that's the only thing I know how to do really. And it was just the closest music school and also the only school I applied to. So thank goodness that <laughs> I got in. Otherwise I wouldn't have done anything. But yeah, I don't know. Nash- Nashville is full of like, country roots and then like indie songwriters which is cool but I feel like it is only that you know (laughs) how did you find it there like did you try and kind of connect with the music scene at all beyond college um I think I played like two shows as a Nashville resident and they were kind of just like band nights you know like battle the bands type thing but it's there's so many talented musicians is kind of what I got out of it I just feel like it was a really good experience to just like be around all these musicians all the time, which in Atlanta, it's like everybody's a creative, but it's always something different. Like there's so many different mediums of just like creativity in Atlanta that I did not find in Nashville, which I felt like I really missed. Do you think you ever would have stayed in Nashville? Like, do you think there's an an alternate universe where you kind of stayed and like tried to make it in the kind of Nashville songwriting machine? Probably not. Maybe if I went earlier, like at a younger age where I didn't really know what I wanted, I feel like it would have been possible. But I feel like as a young adult, it was kind of like I'm finding myself, I'm finding my sound and like who I want to be, who I'm happy with. And I don't think I would have ever stayed. So you've expressed this kind of sentiment of like the kind of stuff you got out of, I guess, working with Awful and stuff like that was this kind of sense of community. And I wonder how you hold on to something like that as your music becomes more successful and as you kind of, you know, step into like playing much bigger shows, working with much bigger labels, that kind of thing. Yeah, I feel like it was such a beautiful learning experience for me just to be a part of a group that was just like so close and like it wasn't always about music it felt like family first and then (laughs) and then we'll do music together but it was nice because I had I had really never worked on music with other people before it was like a new concept to me and I wasn't really comfortable doing it and I feel like just being around musicians every day in Atlanta I really just like opened a new door for me but definitely overall always always thankful forever (laughs) for that group do you think you still make music in that way that you kind of like developed while you were kind of making music with all those people yeah for sure I feel like doing collabs or just like always working with somebody else is is important just because nobody's brain works the same way so it's like nice to like I guess like almost subconsciously learn from making music or doing what this other person also does that you do and just getting a different mindset of it and like a different approach. And I feel like it was influential in ways that I will never know and can never explain, but will keep doing somehow. Kind of on that, you said that May Ihara was a big influence on this record and she features on Overslept. Can you tell me a bit about her, like how you found her music and, and how it kind of came to influence you? 
Yeah, she was just a related artist to this other artist that I was listening to. Um, and I literally never like scroll down and click on the related art. Like I've never done that in my life. But I was just like in the tour of it, so endlessly bored. And just like the first 30 seconds of listening to her, I was just like, this is, I feel like I found my soulmate. <laughs> like this is the coolest shit I've heard. And I relate to so much. she just became like such a big influence just like listening to her music every day her instrumentation was brilliant to me I feel like we're very similar in a lot of ways but also I don't know I just felt like I was always learning something new listening to her and yeah I kind of just felt like since she was such an important musical influence for me or inspiration I, I felt like it would be only the right thing to have her on my project are there moments on this album that you listen to and you can really distinctly kind of hear her influence yeah i've never thought about that question that's crazy yeah i'm sure there's moments i don't know i feel like our bands are so similar which is really funny for me to say that i really like her because i don't want it to be like i like myself (laughs) um But yeah, I don't know. I feel maybe more strongly the opposite, like listening to her music and hearing me, which is maybe the only way that my brain can can find it because it's not analyzing my own work. It's analyzing somebody else's work. How did you connect with her and kind of what was the process of, of putting that song together? I just like followed her on Instagram and then she like followed me back while I was in the tour van. I was like screaming. I was like, guys. (laughs) <laughs> she followed me back um and from there it was just like sending her dms and then like from there it was like we emailed each other every time we did something cool like covered a new song or like we would share playlists and yeah i think it just got to a point where we were picking each other's brains so much that i was like dude you can say no <laughs> but would you like to sing on this song <laughs> it would mean a lot to me i really love you um so yeah it was It worked out really, really well. Did that song kind of accomplish, like listening to that song, does it have the same qualities of of her music that you really kind of connected to and love? I mean, it was way different because it was just my band, you know, and it was her singing. Um, And obviously I don't know what she's saying until she translates stuff for me. But I think like if she had asked me to be on her song, (laughs) like, you know, like it would have been the same, I don't know how to explain it. But yeah, I think it was just kind of like me topping off this important chapter for me, if that makes sense. But I mean, hopefully in the future it'd be more uh, collaborative if we could be in person and like share bands and stuff. (laughs) So this album is kind of on an emotional level. It's quite different from Atlanta Millionaires Club. Like that record was kind of a little maybe lonely or something. This one kind of focuses on this different set of trials, kind of like navigating the early parts of a relationship. At what point during the kind of writing and recording did you kind of step back and realize like, oh, like this is the kind of record that I've made? Yeah, it really wasn't until the end. I feel like when I'm recording, it's not like I'm making a record. It's, okay, here's songs I wrote and I'm tracking them. And eventually it'll be a whole. Um, But it's not really till it's all done. And you're looking at it as a group, hearing it as a group where I was like, dang, I'm like mentally stable and happy now. And like, (laughs) like it really was uh, just like a more hopeful project from what I feel like I was I was making in the past. Can you tell me a little about the kind of writing and recording of the album? Like, how is this one as compared to the last one? Yeah. So the last one, it was it was just um I would write a song and then the next day get all these people together and record it and just do that over months. 
But yeah, because of the pandemic, it, it wasn't safe to do that. So by the time it was safe, I feel like I had bottled up like five or six songs and just like had to spend two weeks in the studio recording back to back. And I've never done that before. And it was really stressful and just like, I don't know, it was a good learning experience for me. So yeah, the the recording process was a little different, but I think at the end of the day, it was, it was okay. And I don't think you can hear the difference. Do you think that that kind of style of recording, like just doing it all in one block is something that you'll try again? Um, if I have to, I feel like it was a good learning experience for when I'm not able to do that again, just to like be ready to, to approach it differently. But I feel like if it's up to me, I'm definitely going to choose the way I'm most comfortable with just because I think it's, it's healthier for me mentally. What do you think this album says about the kind of period in your life in which it was written? The word I've been using is just like more hopeful, which really somebody else told me. (laughs) And I was like, oh, you're right. But yeah, I think it's more of just like, I just feel like I've been in a better situation uh, in my life. Um, and And I do think it reflects that. The album is interesting because I guess it has these quite kind of vivid portraits of domesticity, I guess, for lack of a better word. I'm interested, like, how do you get in the zone of kind of like when you're writing about, I guess, this one topic, like keeping it interesting for yourself, keeping it interesting in terms of your songs, I guess, after Atlanta Millionaire's Club, which, you know, felt so, I guess, each song felt like it was about kind of like different situations or different scenarios. I feel like I've just gotten really comfortable with my songwriting in in the sense of just like being ready and being able to say the first thing that comes to my head and just like these thoughts that I'm not not really addressing before um and I think because of how comfortable I've gotten I've I found myself yeah writing about different stuff or just like things that I haven't written about before and I think it's because I'm just really comfortable saying what I want to say now the title track, I Know I'm Funny, Haha, ha, like uses its title in such an interesting way. In the context of the song, it's almost like a little wistful or kind of almost self-defensive in context. And like, why is that phrase in this context so important to that song and also the, the album? Yeah, I don't know. I feel like it just really stuck out to me when I was trying to name it. And I kind of struggled naming this record just because last record, I, I knew what it was going to be before it was even done. I knew the album cover, like I knew what I wanted to do. And with this, I was just focusing on making music and I just didn't know what to do. And I feel like when it got to the time to decide and I was just like going through lyrics, just trying to like pick and pull, I feel like it was really just the obvious answer for me. But yeah, it's kind of actually funny <laughs> because it does have such different meanings when you think about it. And even when people say it, every time somebody says it, they say it completely different, like put emphasis on different parts of the sentence and just like say ha ha so differently. Um, so I think, I don't know, I'm really satisfied with, with that decision. Let's sit around and drink some sake And we can argue about the same thing talk me through the writing of that song a little because I I feel like it touches on a lot of the kind of main I guess themes or ideas that are present on the rest of the album yeah I feel like that song is really random in a sense where I think I just felt like writing and I had nothing to write about (laughs) and so it's just like these three completely different verses about completely different random things and when I was writing it I remember thinking I was like this feels like a Mad Libs where you just like fill in the blank with random shit but I feel like it worked and I feel like they were just all three verses were all three important stories to me at the time that were just like new and fresh and like sitting on my mind and I felt like if I could not get it out and express it I I would just always think about these things. 
And then a song like Cheers is quite different, I guess, tonally from the rest of the album. Like it kind of chugs along and it's a bit less of this kind of like um, 70s R&B or like country vibe. Why did you want that song to be so kind of tonally distinct from the rest of the record? Yeah, I don't think it was a matter of me wanting it. I feel like when we sat down to record it, it just like felt like that's just how it needed to sound. I don't really share my demos with anybody before we get to the studio just because I don't want people thinking about that stuff. So like playing this while we were live tracking, it was everybody's first time hearing this. It's my first time playing it since I've recorded it because I never like to just hear things over and over because I feel like I just change it. So yeah, I think when I played it, everybody was just like, we tried to just kind of play it how I wrote it. And then it just felt like it was literally calling to be something different and people were just like in the moment I don't know just like it, it really was a, a natural effect when you were writing were there any kind of like domestic love songs or kind of like songs about I guess like domesticity or, or long-term relationships in this sense that you kind of looked towards for inspiration for this record there were two artists that I was listening to a lot during the making of this record which is Mei Ihara who's on the record and then Hannah Cohen has a record uh, called Welcome Home that was really influential for me. But yeah, not not any specific song, but I, I feel like, I don't know, their, both of their music makes me so happy. <laughs> and so maybe I just like listened to it a lot and like also wanted to reflect this like happiness that I was also feeling. As more and more people kind of listen to your music, do you worry about the kind of like diaristic element of it? Like, is that ever a concern for you? I feel like I like that. Like, I prefer that. I want to do whatever will make me more relatable to a human just because I I don't want to stand out or feel like people think of me higher than themselves or like, I don't know. I feel like that's such a weird thing and I just want people to know like I'm so normal like I am literally also a human being just like you so I feel like sharing my life and just like what's inside my head that normally only you get to know yeah I just feel like I I hope people just relate to it more which is nice do you ever feel a need to kind of square that with like an urge for privacy to I guess to like make sure you're not kind of giving too much of yourself to to kind of an audience or something? Yeah, sometimes I feel like especially just like in interviews and when strangers come up to me and say something, it's like I'm like, how do you know that? Like I hate that you know that. But at the same time I'm like, I do tell so much about myself. And there is this weird balance because I do really respect privacy and especially on social media. Like I just want to be alone all the time but it's like I have like I don't know it's this it's this really weird thing that that's hard to find a healthy balance but like yeah one time I literally got a dm and it was just like hey were you born on June 25th 1996 and which is like my birthday but one year off and it's just like I just listened to a song and that's just what I get and I was like bro what this is so weird it makes me so uncomfortable but yeah I, I do enjoy not people getting to know me really well, but because I want people to relate because they're going through it as well. Just like have a sense of comfort, I feel like. So there is this really weird balance with both of those. (laughs) Are you someone who kind of naturally feels an urge to use social media or is that kind of element of self-promotion? No, I hate it. Yeah. How have you find kind of adjusting to that? I literally would not have it therapy helps me (laughs) I literally hate that shit um I don't know I mean I don't feel weird being like hey my record's coming out or like hey I'm playing this show but when it's like I don't know it's it's really weird I've been really trying to practice um being more comfortable with it just because it's such a scary thing to me also sorry so your record is coming out on your birthday yeah isn't that crazy yeah, was that intentional? No, they. I don't tell anybody it's my birthday, just because I never, I've never been a really big birthday person. But when my label told me that that was the release date, I was like, "Do you guys know that's my birthday?" And they were like, "No way!" Are you gonna have a combination birthday record release party to celebrate? I'm just gonna pretend the release party is my birthday party. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And the release cake is my birthday cake. Yeah. So. I love this track, A Dream with a Baseball Player, which is about having a crush on a baseball player. 
And I'm interested, how important is kind of like fantasy to your music or to your songwriting process? I feel like not not that important just because with my songwriting, I've, I've always been the type of person who has to write about personal experience. Like I know people who can read a book and just like write a song about this book or like some made up. And I'm just like, I've, I've never been able to do that. So I don't know. I feel like that song is like, you know, very dreamlike and it is me living in a fantasy, but it's a personal fantasy that I had at the time. You know what I mean? Like, it's still like a very personal experience. And I guess on the on the topic of baseball, like when I read about you, I feel like there's always a mention of kind of like games, like there's yo-yo, chess, Nintendo Switch, going to the batting cages, like stuff like that. I was wondering, what do you love about games, all these various different kinds of games? Like, what what do you think's led you to being kind of like, for lack of a better word, like a hobbyist in this way? I don't know. I feel, I just like feeling like a kid sometimes. <laughs> like you, I feel like everything is in life is taken so seriously that it makes games and just like fun pastimes extra fun. Literally fun. I don't know. It just makes me happy. <laughs> I think that's that's as good a place as any to leave it there. Um, thank you so much for coming on the podcast to talk about your new album. I know I'm funny. Ha ha. Thanks. Yeah, it was nice talking to you and nice to meet you too. That was Faye Webster in conversation with the Fade as Shard D'Souza. Webster's new album, I Know I'm Funny Ha Ha, is out on June 25th via Secretly Canadian. Our engineer is Tony Giambroni, and our associate producer is Salvatore Mackey. We'd like to thank Lauten Audio for providing our microphones. You can find them at lautenaudio.com. And we'd like to thank James Ivey for providing our intro music. Remember to follow The Fader interview wherever you listen to podcasts, and keep an eye on thefader.com for essential music news, interviews, and essays. We'll be back next week with another episode of The Fader interview. Goodbye until then. You know that one song you can't get enough of? Chances are it was made with a sample from Splice. Explore top packs made by your favorite producers, sketch out song ideas in seconds with Create Mode, and dive into a sample catalog that's so deep, it's dangerous. Find out why Splice is the industry's not-so-secret secret. Visit splice.com and try for free today.